Ladies, gentlemen and drummers of all ages, please put your hands together for the host of the Mike Dolbear Drum Show, Mr. Mike Dolbear. Thank you very much and welcome to the first ever Mike Dolbear Drum Show. What are you going to expect to see today? We don't know. But we've got some great guests. We've got Gavin Harrison. We've got Cherie Sosea. <laughs> and we've got the one and only Yard. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> we have also got our newsreader and our control, Jill. Yay! <laughs> and the stick. How are you today, stick? <laughs> okay. So, this is the first one we've ever done. And uh, we've got lots of new features and features throughout the show. And we're going to start off with um, talking to the guests. So, Gavin, thank you for uh, coming along and uh, being our guinea pig. Pleasure. So, a new album. Yes, new album. Only available on Wax Cylinder. No, um, this is the LP, of course, but there is CD and all the other stuff to go with it. It's basically um, kind of modern, contemporary brass arrangements of Porcupine Tree songs done by the brilliant Lawrence Cottle, who you may well know. Yeah. Okay, why now? Why now? Well, because uh, I've been working on it for five years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> I would have put it out years ago if I'd have finished it in time. Right. Okay, so you've done this um, slightly different. Um, for start, it's in surround sound. Yep. And I've got to say that I came around to the studio and I heard it. You got me sitting in the perfect place to listen to it and it sounded amazing but you've done it's a big band album but you've recorded it slightly in a more modern slant well you know we did it in a kind of modern way it's not a purist way to record a big band the arrangements are really really difficult and the logistics of getting about 18 people in a room to play it would have been too much so actually it's you know recorded every instrument's recorded one at a time you know, it's not the traditional way to do it, but it's not a traditional album. Mm. But it also gives me uh, great control in the mix, and it gives me great control for surround if I want to put, you know, one instrument in each corner or have them all slide round together. That wouldn't have been possible if you would have, for instance, had four trumpet players all playing at the same time into four mics. Yeah. You wouldn't have that sort of separation. Okay. So it's a kind of modern production. So you're not going to be taking this out on the road for... A clinic tour then in the next... Uh... I'll take the album with me, yeah. this copy of it. <laughs> yeah. um, you've also been busy with King Crimson. That's right. Um, with Free Drummers. Yep. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit about how that came about? And uh, you've got a UK tour coming up as well. So what's it like working with Free Drummers? Uh, noisy, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's a great challenge, actually. I mean, with all the uh, challenges, there's, if you're looking for it, there's good opportunities. So we try to think of it as one drummer with six arms and six legs, or more like an orchestral percussion section, rather than have us all play the same thing at the same time. Sometimes we play certain parts of the kit between the, the three of us. Sometimes Bill Riflin plays keyboards. Pat Mastelotto's got a lot of electronics on his kit. So, you know, there's a lot of variation we can do. And really, the, the hard work is in in the arranging mm. and the choreography, which we will actually start. We're going to start rehearsing tomorrow. Um, this is for our September tour. We do kind of little pockets of rehearsal, usually three or four little pockets of rehearsal, because you just need time in between the rehearsals to, to think and learn the songs and write the songs out and try to imagine how three drummers could play such difficult songs. Yeah. Cool. Cherise. Hello. Cherie, so say, I've known you for a long time now. Yes, yeah, possibly. Yeah, forever. Yeah, so, yeah, forever. So thank you for bringing a little bit of a glamour to the, to the uh, couch today. I'm sorry. That's all right. Well, you know, you always brought enough glamour, I think, you know. And you're, <laughs> doing it. you're judging Hit Like a, Hit like a Girl, a new yes. drum competition that's been running. Um, I am, yes. And you don't hit like a girl. But well, well, hopefully not. Well, no, I don't. No, I try not to. You know, like I try and just hit like a normal drummer, I guess. Yeah. I just play, 
you know, yeah. Well, what advantages I mean, and disadvantages has it been being a female in this, in this uh, industry? Well, obviously, like, I have no idea what it's like being a male drummer. Really? <laughs> no, I okay. haven't. <laughs> I <are> know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, you know, but, um, yeah, one thing I do know is that, you know, like, it is difficult um, coming up against people's preconceptions of what female drummers are capable of. So this means, you know, that you do have to keep proving yourself. Um, you have to work doubly as hard. You have to be the best you can be, so, you know, to make sure that you do get work and, you know, and like, and continue to, you know, to get gigs. Mm. Um, yeah, the nature of the industry, you know, is such that, you know, we are in a, like a minority, but the industry, you know, like, is changing and, you know, it's coming um, more common for female drummers to be, you know, around. So it's, yeah, it's a good thing, really. Why do you think that is? Well, I guess, like, historically, drumming's been male-dominated. Yep. You know, simply, I guess that's the reason. Um, but, you know, there's more female drummers emerging these days. Yeah. So, yeah, times are changing. You've definitely. been touring now for 10 years, OK? Yeah. You yeah. started with the Faders when you were 17 years old, where you were a band member. Yes. And then you went on to become the session drummer with Mika, Brian Ferry, Paloma Faith. Did you have to learn new skills coming out of being a band member into um, being a hired hand? Yeah, definitely, because when you're a session player, you're sort of, um, you know, you're sort of hired, yeah, to, to play, you know, the artist's vision, you know, you've got to try and um, create their vision, what they mm. want you to do. So you have to kind of, yeah, be very in tune with people, you know, good social skills, and you've got to be able to kind of, yeah, adapt to different situations. So I did have to learn some new skills, definitely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yard. Now, first of all, can you tell me your surname? Because I can't pronounce it. I do apologise. I can't either, so you're in trouble. Okay, <laughs> well, 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 that I'm pleased about. So, Yard, you've worked with Steve Gadd, Charlie Watts, Simon Kirk, you know, Henry Spinetti, the list goes on of the nicest people in the music industry. And you've also worked for Ginger Baker. Now, True. please, my, my meetings with Ginger have not gone down well. So how does that work out? <laughs> well, uh, when I first got the call to work with Ginger, I thought, don't know, it goes against my uh, mantra, really. And, um, but he was a childhood hero of mine, and I thought, if I don't do it, someone else will. And I thought, if I'm nice to him, he'll be nice to me. And it worked out okay. You know, I don't, I don't stand for any funny stuff. Right. So I thought, it's either going to end nicely or we're going to have a, a stand-up row. But I couldn't turn it down. So yeah. have you seen the film? I have. And was what you saw on the film the ginger baker that you knew? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, then let's leave it there. But I, um, <laughs> I found him okay for me. Okay. But. So how did you get into, I mean, you've, you've actually got a, an, an incredible CV. And, you know, without, you know, because we do have a little well, bit of a, a joke, me and you. But, you know, for anyone that's, guys like Steve Gadd, you are their first call to contact. How did you get into hey, teching hey, in the hey. first place? Um, Can you behave yourself over there, well, I, uh, <laughs> I played till I was around 25. And um, my brother-in-law was our guitar player when he was old enough. And um, he kind of went into the business with what was the forerunner of Iron Maiden. And um, so I was always in touch. And he, he did a load of other... He joined Visage and took Midua's place and then did a load of work at the studios, Trident and stuff. And then I ended up working for a load of musicians on the building side, which mm. is my trade as a carpenter and joiner. And um, so I got to know all these people through that. And he was with the Q-Tips with Paul Young and stuff in the early days. So all those bands from the 80s, pub gigs and 70s, all became mates. And at some of the Pistols and stuff with Cook and Jones, he was good friends with all that lot. And it sort of developed from there. So I knew them socially. And then, because um, I'd run my own business and all that, they'd say to me, we're doing a pub gig. Do you want to come and do it? And I think, great, yeah, let's go. So all the people I ended up working with, they'd come down and guest. And just, they'd phone each other up and just say, we're down so-and-so in Camden. Do you want to come down? So they'd just turn up with their guitar. And everyone would just do standard covers. And that's a lot of bad company. Yeah. <laughs> so all those people, you get, you get Bernie Marsden pop up. Yep. Also Neil Murray, all those people would just turn up because they're all friends. Cool. And then the more I did, then people used to say to me, you want to do this? We think you'd be good at it. And due to, um, not just the tech inside, but due to the fact that I'd run my own business and come from a business family, 
I got into the production side. It's, it's a case of like watching the pennies and also being able to deal with people. Yeah. And, um, and so as it worked, the, the more I did, the less building I did. And now my, my boys do all the building and I just float about and as the old bloke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So, Gillian. Apologies, Stick's getting impatient. Oi. Yeah, he's misbehaving over there. He's getting a little bit impatient. Um, so, what have we got in the way of drum news? Drum news this week. We have, uh, so the American drummer J.P. Bouvier is, will be in Edinburgh in April doing a clinic drum tours at Drum Central on the 21st and an intensive camp on the 22nd and 23rd. Uh, he will also be offering one-on-one -on -one lessons. So, if you are interested, uh, just get in touch. Uh, if Peter Cater is doing a, his Big Band 20th anniversary concert in London... He's only the, 15 years old, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it's on the 20th of April. Uh, since making his London debut in 1995, Peter Cater has established himself as the UK's number one big band drummer and band leader. Uh, with his award-winning orchestra, this exclusive concert will feature uh, the biggest hits as well as some rarely performed songs by Buddy Rich. Um, repertoire and also cover five decades of big band hits. Uh, tickets are £15 from 7.30pm. Uh, the 25th annual uh, Chicago Drum Show is on the May 15th to the 17th this year. Uh, Organiser Rob Cook has actually come out and said that this year they've actually put in more space uh, to welcome 16 new exhibitions. There will also be many clinics, master classes, as well as some very special guests. Mm -hmm. um, the Hit Like a Girl competition, as we discussed before, it has opened for entries. Uh, there are actually two categories. One is for under 18 and the other is for 18 and over. Uh, there are 17 judges, including Cherise. 17 judges? <laughs> 17. I went, on the, website. I went on the yeah. website and actually counted how many judges there were. There's 17 judges. <laughs> Can I enter? No, no. <laughs> for girls only. Uh, if you wish to enter, all you have to do is record a three-minute uh, drumming clip of yourself, a brief bio telling your drumming story, as well as a picture with your drums. Uh, this is to be uploaded to the Hit Like a Girl website, which is www.hitlikeagirlcontest.com. Entries close on the 8th of April. Wow. Um, there are some actually great reviews and interviews on the Mike Dolware website this month with, the, for example, Ginger Hamilton has come done an interview who played for the likes of Kelly Rowland and Jesse J. Uh, he's discussed his early influences as well as what his dream gig would be. Um, and Pete Ray Biggin has shared some great stories as well of some of the artists he's played with uh, and also actually said what his big dream gig it was so far. Now, if you have any questions about anything we've done today or um, have any general news you'd like to send us in to talk about, please do let us know. Uh, and any form, more, any information on the stuff we've just talked about uh, on the news, uh, please head to mikedelbear.com. Now, I wanted to know, Mike, <laughs> when you were a little boy in Brighton, <laughs> When I was a little boy. Running around with long, luscious hair. Yeah. Um, cool, what yeah. was your dream gig then, and have you achieved it? Um, actually, I don't know if I want to say this embarrassingly on air. I think I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to work. I just wanted to play the drums. But I always did, and I still am a big Barbara Streisand fan. <laughs> I'm just, it's, it's out there. That is okay? not the response the I was Exactly, <laughs> hence the look and the long hair. So I think if anyone, it would probably be Barbara Streisand. Um, but I've never set myself any, any uh, artists to work with because uh, you just can't achieve that goal. So, uh, so the answer right, to that question I'm is, sure this the, is it. I'm sure look, just being with these guys and these girls, that's all, that's, I've, I've achieved everything I need. I'm sure the stick has his own drink gig, which is just about to happen now. I'm sure. Okay, so over to the stick. So this section here, guys and girls, is we've got two drum kits here, which Gillian's going to tell you a little bit about in a minute. Um, and one is high-end priced, and the other is low-end price. My guests are going to put some um, blindfolds on, and um, they're going to listen to the drums. They've, been, they've got the same drum heads on, they've been tuned the same, and uh, I just want to you know, for you guys to tell us a little bit what you hear, what you sound like, um, and also maybe the audience um, will have a thumbs up and a thumbs down, not on the sticks playing, but um, <laughs> on, on what you're hearing and what you're seeing. Didn't so can like you tell that. us a little bit about what, uh, what we've All got? Right. So both kits are actually pretty much the same. They uh, both have a 10 by 7, 12 by 8. Uh, the floor is 16 by 14 and uh, the kick is 22 by 18. The price one is £539 and the other one is, is £1,539. Ooh, bargain. 
a bargain. Special deal today. <laughs> OK, so, if you'd like to put your blindfolds on, please, guests, you look lovely. OK, <laughs> nick their wallets. Let's get out of here. <laughs> OK, so, let's play one of the kits. Thank you very much for your performance. Okay, move away from the drum kits. Move away from the drum kits. <laughs> Give me the sticks. <laughs> so, um, we're not looking at... Oh. Um, what we're, you can take your blindfold oh. off now, Sharice, it's fine. You're you almost asleep there, Mike. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so please don't judge him when he's drumming. I know you're judging Hit Like a Girl, but please, please don't <laughs> judge him on to. this. So what we're looking here is a comparison between two drum kits. Like I said, one's priced at 1,800 pounds, One's priced at £600 with hardware. Um, so, Gavin, any, any views on what you're hearing and the sounds? The two I kits? liked the bass drum sound of the first kit. Okay. Had a great attack to it. I mean, it's quite ambient in this room, yeah. so they, they both sounded very good, I can say. Okay. But yeah, I, I preferred the bass drum on the first kit. Okay. Um, Cherise? Yeah, I'd say that I agree with Gavin. I definitely, yeah, definitely preferred the the first drum kit mm. you know it sounded yeah quite yeah quite warm it's hard to tell in this room because yeah, it's very yeah. you know but no it sounded quite good yeah quite nice yeah. yard same for me and uh i just thought same again the, the bass drum sounds great and um but i think that one's very good value for money okay so you can tell yeah. the difference which ones yeah. you played as well yeah okay um on, on a teching point of view you know can you get you know you can get a bottom end kit and make it sound good or yeah you, know, okay. you can it's uh the main thing is getting decent heads and then um and then paying attention to tuning you always whenever you start on a kit you've always got to turn it over mm. and do the resonant head first otherwise you're fighting a losing battle but if you pay attention to your tuning um you can get a sound out of any drum kit really depends how much what age you are how much you want to spend but just buying a top of the range kit doesn't always guarantee you're going to get great sound if you can't tune. Do you, open to all of you, do you think that you could take a bottom end kit out on the road and it would be road worthy? Or do you think that would be a disadvantage because of the hardware? Or yeah, no, I think you could. I mean, the kits yeah. today, the budget kits today are so much better than, you know, when I was a yeah, kid. And, yeah. Yeah. I think the, the real advice is, yeah, you need to get some decent drum skins and you need to really push your budget more towards the cymbals than the drums. Because mm. you can do something with a, with a drum set. You know, you could even have the bearing edges recut. You know, you can change the heads, you can tune it, you can dampen it. But if you've got bad cymbals, they'll always sound like bad cymbals. Right, yeah. So, you yeah. know, if you've only got a certain amount of budget, I would allocate trying to get some decent cymbals. Zildjian's are great, by the way. <laughs> Um, we are talking to a Zildjian Zildjian. artist yeah, at the moment. Zildjians yeah. are very good. Yeah, I can are. recommend those. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, a good, if you buy a good ride cymbal, a good pair of hi-hats, good crash cymbal, that could last you 25 years. Mm -hmm. I've still got my cymbals that I bought late 70s, early 80s. I could still play them. Yeah. They, still, they don't go off. Yeah. Some people might argue they actually get better over time. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, either of those drum kits sounded easily good enough you know, to do the job. I mean, coming to you, Yard, um, you know, my first drum kit was a, an Olympic drum kit, different colour yeah. drums. Same uh, here. Yeah, and which a lot of people's it was. And to be honest, it was nowhere near the standard of, you know, these no. kits that are no. coming out now. Um, what about the audience? So let's have a hands for kit one, which is 
was this one over here. So anyone that liked kit one, let's show our hands. Okay, kit two. Okay, pretty equal actually. Okay, so obviously for those that uh, don't know, the kit one is the one that's uh, street value is 1500 £1, pounds including hardware. Uh, no. No. And this, the second one is £600 with hardware. No hardware. There you go. Uh, 539. So, um, okay. Thank you. Now. Are they, I, so, sorry, are they actually different shells? Or they're, they're, they're different, different shells. Wood? Different wood, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and I, like I said, I think they look, uh, you know, it'd be really tough with the kind of money that you want to spend not to be able to get a decent budget kit at, uh, you know, it sounds great. Um, right, now I asked all my guests to bring in a show and tell. Uh, for those that are watching this that don't come from England, this is something that we do at schools in England when we bring in something and we show and tell. Um, so, uh, Sorry, so, Gavin's face looked a bit confused there. Well, <laughs> it's just realised he forgot it. At school, right? <laughs> I've so, never heard of it. And I don't know what we've got coming up here. So, so Gavin, show and tell, what have you brought with you? Well, this is something that's been bothering me for a long time. And it's socks, right? Now, about, <laughs> about five years ago, I don't know if you noticed this, about five years ago, socks started getting a lot longer in this part. Have you noticed that? Yeah, actually, you're right. Because right, yeah. I was used to wearing this length sock. I always wear odd socks, by the way. Look. Oh my right? God, you do. And <laughs> once it gets above there, it really starts to itch and bother me. Right now, all the socks I've been seeing in the popular shops, shall we say, are now about <laughs> two inches longer. So I've been searching the internet. I found these, which are the length of the socks I would wear at school, for instance. Right. But and your it, legs were shorter. Well, my legs were short, so maybe that's, that's the illusion. But I, it, it has been bugging me. I just wanted to get off my chest, really. So hopefully. Is that what you meant by show and tell? Yeah, because maybe there might be somebody out there now that could design socks the perfect length yeah. for Gavin. Odd colours. Odd colours. Don't waste weeks and weeks of your life pairing socks together. It's not worth it. It's not what you could be practising. Okay. <laughs> that's my tip. That's your tip of the day. <laughs> okay. Wow. Beat that. Well, Cherise. I don't think I can beat that. That's pretty good. The socks. Yeah. yeah. It's obviously your point, but no. Um, yeah, so I brought in this record, which was my first band record. Um, Do you want to explain to the younger audience what a record is? Oh, yeah. Well, it's this round thing that plays music. <laughs> it's quite good, actually. It sounds quite nice. Um, yeah, basically, so this is yeah, when, like, one of my first bands that I was in. It's a band called The Faders. Um, I was 17, and yeah, like, we were signed to Polydor Records. It was my first big, yeah, like first big um, professional success. And basically, yeah, like we were in all like the TV shows, all the magazines, you know, Top of the Pop, CD UK, all that stuff. We had some success in America and Southeast Asia. And basically this record is, a, yeah, it's like, a, like a, yeah, represents like, like all the memories of, yeah, of my time in the band. Okay. Um, and also like it was the first time that I had to confront the issues about my stutter, which is something that, you yeah, know, a lot of people know that I have basically. Um, and yeah, in the faders, I was thrown in front of TV cameras and I just had to learn how to manage it. You know, so I learned how to control it. So um, yeah, yeah, like I owe like a lot of my time. Um, yeah, like I owe a lot to my time in the faders because right. it helped me sort of, you know, Did they give you people it. to help you overcome that? Or was it just get out there and do it? Yeah, just got out there and do it. Yeah, I did it on my own, really. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah I got out there and did it. There's a lot of drummers out there that suffer from nerves. Yeah. Um, it's very common nerves and um and they don't they have to sort of fight through it and i think yeah, the comfort zone is the, the drum kit we've got a drum kit there that's our you comfort hide zone behind it. yeah hide behind exactly it. yeah but as soon as you step out from it and I, yeah. I know i felt you know as soon as i had a microphone in my hand it's like oh, where's my comfort blanket yeah okay. me too i mean yeah. you, and then you find out how long you can hold your stomach in for right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well you could go running and then you don't have that problem going oh, no like I do run past your house on a regular basis. You never join me, so you know. Teresa, I see that it's all scratched here. What you've scratched? Know. You scratched, the, scratched did, in the. Did yeah, you do that band. on every single record? We did, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yard, what have you got with you today? I, I brought in a couple of things actually, but this will do. It's not socks. No, this is a. This is a Ginger Baker, original symbol bag. Does he know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he hopes so. He does now. But um, I got him a new one when he got some 
he's, he's got his original symbol set, apart from a couple of bits. And um, so when we got some new ones, they sent it in a bag. And uh, so I gave him the bag, he said, oh, that looks nice. And then looked at that and said, you might as well have that. Because he, he doesn't keep anything, he's only got one drum kit. Right. He's got a leady snare, which he's had forever, and his cymbal set. And he's not interested in anything else. So when people send stuff and saying, can he try this? He goes, he just looks at it. He says, what's that? I said, symbols for you to try. He goes, nah. So I've got my symbol set. He won't even pick them up, tap them, nothing. It's just, and the, pro, and the pros know what they want and why, yeah. and they stick with it. You've got, um, if no one doesn't know, they should check it out on, uh, on Yard's website because you run Vintage Yard, okay, and you've got actually some really cool stuff down there that you've collected up over the years and mm. it's almost like a little bit of a museum yeah. um I, you should open it up actually as a museum um, <laughs> but what's the coolest item the you've got down there <laughs> the coolest what's the your favorite uh i think well i've got some good i've got some historic kind of stuff to yeah. me like i've got bobby graham's final kit when he passed away i've got henrit's Heyman kit the dolly mixture one um Slingerland Radio Kings and things, but um, I think my favourite down there, uh, one of them actually, is a gold Heyman kit, which um, is a copy of what Simon Kirk had with, during his three days, mm -hmm. who's my main man. But um, it's a Gretsch 24, 13, 16, 18, white marine pearl, mm. 60s kit. It, and er, all my sons walk through there and go, I want that kit. When you've gone. Yeah, when you're dead, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how nice long is that going to be exactly? <laughs> okay. So I've also got some, um, some small accessories that have been sent over that I want to hand around to see if the, you would use these in your day-to-day -day work. Do okay? you want the stick to... Are you uh, trusting the stick? You can, no, I'm going to hand these over to the... You can pass these around to the guests in a minute. So we've got these wrist builders, okay? And these wrist builders are... Made of aluminium. I thought drummers did it differently. Um, uh, Christ, they're heavy, aren't they? They're very heavy. They are very heavy. Might be good for just putting through a vampire's heart <laughs> or something. <laughs> uh, I probably wouldn't use them, okay. though, to be honest. Oh, my God. No, these are, yeah, really, really, really heavy. Okay. I suppose yeah, that's I, the point, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, would, I mean, do you think you need, do you be, need them to improve your wrists? I think you need it to be this Or do you need a pair of sticks and that should be... Maybe a pair of heavy sticks would do you. I don't think you need to go this. Okay. Yeah, to this. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't use them. Actually. Be careful, yard, they're heavy. <laughs> well, they're no good for me, actually, because it doesn't matter. I only do sound checks. Okay, yeah. so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. We well, just play the kit and then. So you wouldn't be able to give them to Steve Gann, because they're black. Maybe yeah. Steve would want to use them on one of his easy Eric Clapton gigs. No. No. no like, the, the thing with the pros, is they know what they want and yeah. why, and then all the new stuff, they just shrug and no. <laughs> Do you want to hand them around the stick? And, uh, They're heavy. So they They're are heavy. Very extremely. Don't fall over. So yeah, we've, exactly. got <laughs> <laughs> we've got this, uh, we've also got this new item that's just come out called drum tacks. Um, and drum tacks are a little bit like moon gel, um, sticky back. They're meant to last a little bit longer. But again, is this something that you would use or um, uh, a bit of gaffer tape? I don't tend to use, I mean, maybe on the snare drum I might want to reduce the ring a little bit, but I like the drums to, to ring quite a lot. Actually, I found out the other day, I found a really good trick. If you've got two floor toms and they're ringing a lot, if you put something like this or a bit of Velcro in between and touch the drums together mm. so they're actually touching, that reduces the uh, sustain quite yeah. a lot, mm. but without affecting the sound of the drum. Because when you start putting this all over your, on, on the top head, then the attack changes right. and the character of the drum changes. But I, I prefer the drums to sort of... So you wouldn't use those? I probably wouldn't use them, no. Okay. okay. Shoes? Um, well, I tend to actually use, um, yeah, moon gel and gaffer on my okay. Just yeah, find that moon gel sometimes drums. gets, it looks like a bit of chewing gum after a while. It does look a bit manky after yeah. a while. It, it, it is, a bit it's OCD, true. I mean. It tastes good though. Yeah, well, that might be the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might use these, okay. maybe. Yeah, possibly. I'll think? try them out. What I'll try them out. Well, I'll, I'll, try. I'll try them, yeah, exactly. But uh, a lot of it, for me, depends on the drummer, because they, they kind of tell you what they want, what right. they want. I thought you and had complete control over and you told the drummers what you want <laughs> they need to do. Uh, I, I'm just there to do as they ask. Um, 
I'd give it a try. Yeah. But, um, okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, well, let's see how they sound. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We've actually come to the end of our show. Um, I think we may have time for one very, very quick question that somebody sent in. So have you got a question for the team over here? Well, I'll put one out for, for everybody, um, which is uh, Ash asked, how, to know, how do you know which gigs or to take, particularly when there's clashes and you obviously want to do all of them. So how do you decide which is your... Oh, well, it's the just a quick with. one because we're running out of time. So how do you know, Gavin? Oh, it's been very rare that I've actually been offered two gigs at the same time. But <laughs> normally, I, if I've made a commitment to one of them, I don't pull out of the first one. Okay. Even if the second one's worth more money or I fancy doing it, mm. I just don't like letting people down. No. That's why I'm here, really. Yeah, I know, because you don't like to have <laughs> <laughs> I could have been earning a lot more money driving a bus, Mike. <laughs> sure be honest Yeah, with that's you. generally the way that you do it. Yeah, the one that you've committed to first, you generally stick with that one, because you want to get like a reputation of sort of jumping from gig to gig. So you want to, yeah, if you commit to something, then commit to it, okay. basically. Is what Yard? Uh, yeah, same for me. If, um, we generally know way in advance when we're going out and it's, it's the loyalty to the band and stuff. So I tend to stick. If I say yes, I'll do it, I'll do it. Okay. Even if at a cost, it's just... Okay, cool. Well, thank really you very cool. much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Gavin Harrison. Thank you, Sharice. Thank you, Yard. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> the stick. Thank you for the whole team. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.